you uh, what well, has been a very rich uh, discussion today and I am uh, delighted to uh, present the first of um, of two speakers uh, Richard Mao has returned to the pe uh, teaching in the position of professor of faith and public life at Fuller Theological Seminary in Pasadena after serving uh, for 20 years uh, as, as president of, of, that, of the seminary. And during that 20 years, he provided transformative leadership for the largest evangelical seminary in the United States. Uh, before, he, before, becoming, uh, before becoming the president of the, uh, of the seminary, he served for, as uh, provost and pr uh, professor of philosophy for a total, a combined total of about over 20 years. And before that, he, he was at Calvin College for about uh, 15 to, I guess, 17 years. And so he has been in education for many years. And um, he will be speaking on the subject of Calvin, love, and the law. Calvin, law, and love, excuse me. Calvin, law, and love. And just a note, uh, uh, Dr. Mao has to catch a plane. And so he will be departing straight right at 3.30. And so his, uh, he has 20, 20 minutes for speaking. And then uh, he will uh, he will take a few questions, but we will go ahead and, and shut off this portion of the, of the program at 3.30 and allow Dr. Mao to leave. Uh, Richard Mao. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm just delighted to be here. I wish I could uh, stay for the rest of it, but uh, I messed up in my scheduling for this weekend. <clears throat> it would be an understatement to say that uh, Jean-Jacques Rousseau was no admirer of John Calvin's theology. But Rousseau did pay the reformer a high compliment for his political thought. In a footnote in book two of Rousseau's social contract, in a context where Rousseau is laying out the attributes of a wise legislator, he offers this assessment of Calvin's impact on the city of Geneva. Those who only consider Calvin as a theologian do not understand the extent of his genius the drawing up of our wise edicts in which he played a large part does him as much honor as his institutes. Whatever revolution time may bring about in our cult, as long as the love of homeland and liberty is not extinguished among us, the memory of that great man will never cease to be blessed. Well, while Rousseau did not offer any explanation about what wise edicts he had in mind in his celebration of Calvin's political influence in Geneva, many others have explored the connections between Calvin's theology and his perspective on the civil order. My brief comments here will zero in on the interrelationships between the two themes of this conference, law and love. Calvin's overall perspective on law is captured succinctly in his much cited account in book two of his Institutes of what we've come to know as the three uses of the law. In setting forth the first use, Calvin, like Luther and other Reformation thinkers, saw the moral law as summarized in the Sinai Commandments as a spiritual mirror into which we humans can look to be informed of our sinfulness in the light of God's righteousness. Law, Calvin says, and these are his words, warns, informs, convicts, and lastly condemns every man of his own unrighteousness, condemning function. And in the second use, the revealed moral law has a civic function, serving, and here again, Calvin, by fear of punishment to restrain certain men who are untouched by any care for what is just and right unless they're compelled by hearing the dire threats in the law. There was a general Reformation consensus on those two uses, but Calvin is generally viewed as placing a unique emphasis on a third use, whereby the law, in his words, admonishes believers and urges them on in well-doing. The Ten Commandments were to be read each week in a worship service, Calvin insisted, because they are an important set of guidelines for living the Christian life. This positive use of the law is key for grasping Calvin's understanding of the relationship between law and love. 
he refused to accept any law versus love conception. In simple terms, love is what the law is all about, and law is what gives substance to the life of love. To make use of a Kantian type formulation, law without love is blind, and love without law is empty. Any claim to be living a life of love while engaging in adultery, murder, covetousness, dishonoring of parents, stealing and the like is a, a spurious claim. All of that's pretty much consensus thinking among Calvin's spiritual heirs. But the consensus breaks down when the discussion turns to the question of whether Calvin saw the law as having more than a negative function for civil society that is associated with his uh, second use. Can the law also serve as a positive guide for more, a more loving legal system? In addition to telling us what sorts of things we ought to punish in the larger hu human community, does the law also appoint us to a legal system that act actively promotes public virtues? Does the law appoint us to a more loving way of living together in the larger human community? The Calvinist answer to this question has often been a strongly negative one. The Calvinist philosopher Gordon Clark, for example, argued that God introduced political authority into human affairs only because of the need, and these are Clark's words, to control a large number of evil people who are working at cross purposes. End quote. To be sure, even this project of making sure that evil people do not destroy each other can be seen as a loving provision by a, a kindly divine providence. But the underlying question is whether God sees civil government as having more loving purposes than those associated with the mere curbing of sinful passions. Again, it would be interesting to know what Rousseau saw in Calvin that led him to attribute wise edicts to the Genevan reformer. Rousseau was certainly no advocate for a purely negative view of the role of government. Individual wills, he argued at length, must be subordinate to the general will. And an ideal legislator would be completely in tune with the general will. In order to discover the, I'm quoting Rousseau now, in order to discover the rules of society best suited to nations, a superior intelligence beholding all the passions of men without experiencing any of them would be needed. Such an intelligence would seek its own well-being independent of us, and yet be ready to occupy itself with ours. Furthermore, Rousseau goes on, it would have in the march of time to look forward to a distant glory and working in one century to be able to enjoy it in the next. And then Rousseau's punchline, it would take gods to give men laws. Calvin would have agreed with Rousseau's contention here. Good magistrates, he argued, would serve as the vicegerents of God, I'm quoting him, a kind of image of the divine providence, guardianship, goodness, benevolence, and justice. Magistrates occupy, he affirms, uh, and this is unique in the time of the Reformation, a most sacred office inasmuch as they are ambassadors of God. Indeed, says Calvin, magistrates are ministers of God who are assigned, these are his words, to the most sacred and by far the most honorable of all stations in mortal life. The ministry of civil magistrate is the most sacred of all vocations. Here, Calvin is pointing beyond the regular, the rather negative role of political leadership as embodying primarily a referee-type function. The magistrate is functioning properly, he seems to be saying, not just by limiting the effects of evil designs, but also by positively promoting the good. The political scientist Sheldon Wolin, a uh, long time at uh, University of Wisconsin, argued for a positive view of Calvin on these matters in his insightful 1960 book, Politics and Vision, Continuity and Innovation in Western Political Thought, where Wallen presented Calvin as providing a clear alternative to the other political perspectives in Reformation-era Protestantism. Both the Lutherans and the Anabaptists, Wallen argued, 
promoted the idea of an ecclesial, a churchly fellowship that was social without being political. A community which, since it was, and this, uh, this is uh, Woolen, a voluntary union bound by love, faith, and the worshiped presence of Christ could not generate power, domination, and authority, end quote. Those latter features, power, domination, and authority, were associated in the minds of Lutherans and Anabaptists with the coercive patterns of political life, a way of ordering human affairs with which both Lutherans and Anabaptists viewed with varying degrees of suspicion, sometimes even contempt, in which they certainly took to be completely inappropriate to the texture of ecclesial churchly bonding. Calvin, said Wolven, challenged this perspective on two accounts. He took a much more positive view of political life than did Luther and the Anabaptists, and he insisted that the church itself ought to display a kind of political ordering since all communities required some form of institutionalized structuring if they were to maintain their coherence. But in Wallen's account, <clears throat> Calvin was not simply observing that the church would do well to learn a few organizational lessons from political life. There's a larger perspective at work in his thought, one in which both the churchly and the political communities uh, and that uh, in spite of their very different callings, church and, and civic society, possess commonalities and continuities that link them together in a broader sense. Calvin wanted this unity to become more visible in human affairs so that the links between ecclesial virtue and the virtue of the polis could be more clearly displayed in a civil order that would be, as Wallen puts it, not a theocracy, but a corporate community that was neither purely religious nor purely secular, but a compound of both. As Wollen reads Calvin, the reformer was insisting that, and these are Wollen's words, I'm doing some paraphrasing and quoting, that there was a kind of virtue atta attainable only in the political order. The polis then had a unique role to play, equipping human beings with a type of civility and discipline that could not be gained elsewhere. Given the necessity of that discipline for human flourishing, then, it's one of the tasks of the church, as Wolin puts it, to refashion Protestant man into a creature of order, or more accurately, to make him conform to a Christian image of civility. In making this case, Wolin quotes a marvelous comment of Calvin's, one that I've come to see as important for understanding his understanding of civil government as a sacred divine calling. In Calvin's own words, it's an important function of the ordering of society, quote, civil society and government, to shape our manners in accordance with civic justice, to create concord among us, to maintain and preserve a common peace and tranquility. Now the verbs in that comment by Calvin point to something beyond a mere negative policing. God wants civil government to shape our manners, to create concord, to maintain and preserve a common peace and tranquility. <clears throat> Calvin's conception here of a government's duty actively to promote patterns of public virtue continued to show up among his followers in the post-Reformation era. It appears among Scottish Presbyterians in the use of what I take to be a striking image namely that of the governmental leader as a nursing father. I say that this is striking not only for the image itself, but also for the context in which it appeared. These Presbyterian writers were kind of nasty people. Uh, they were involved in major disputes with Catholics and Anglicans and even other Presbyterians. And the arguments often took the form of quite violent struggles for power. And in those struggles for power, these Presbyterians drew heavily from the Old Testament God was a divine ruler, a sovereign Lord, a king who wanted his chosen people, the new Israel, to conform to standards, etc. If the Scottish nation did not live up to those standards, then the country was in deep trouble. Thus the revealing title, one of my favorites of the era, of one of their tracks, The Causes of God's Wrath Against Scotland. It might be great to have a Pepperdine professor write a book called The Causes of God's Wrath Against Malibu. <laughs> uh, but then, 
In the midst of all of this harsh rhetoric, there were these occasional references for the need for nurturing in political life. One writer, for example, insisted that God requires kings to serve their nations as, quote, fathers, nurses, protectors, and guides. Here too, as it turns out, these Presbyterian divines were showing that they took their Old Testament loyalties very seriously. They were drawing on what for us at least is some obscure imagery that is used only on a few occasions in the King James Version of the Old Testament. The breastfeeding image is applied to royalty twice in the book of Isaiah. Here's one. And kings shall be thy nursing fathers, and their queens thy nursing mothers. And then this amazing image in uh, Isaiah 60, verse 16. Thou shalt suck the breast of kings. That's hard to preach on. Uh, you want to put that on your bulletin board. Uh, <laughs> uh, this is not the kind of imagery that most preachers these days would choose to feature in their, their sermons. But it does point in a graphic way to a lesson that has been taken with utmost seriousness by many of John Calvin's followers. This that God wants political leaders to be nurturers. They have recognized that this nurturing image shows up consistently in the Bible, Psalm 72, for example, which says, the righteous king shall come down like rain upon the newly mown grass and showers that water the earth. The basic impulse that informs that kind of biblical expectation isn't limited to a specific era in human history. It encourages even today to keep asking questions of this sort. And these are questions, I believe, that are not only questions about civil love that ought to be promoted by the magistrate, but they're agape love questions. Uh, how can civil law positively promote the cause of religious freedom? Not just by making discrimination against uh, faith communities illegal, but also by providing the conditions for the flourishing of diverse faith communities. What are the appropriate ways for laws to be designed not just to protect life, but also to promote life-giving patterns and policies? And what of those in the, who are referred to in the Torah as the strangers in the land or the stranger within thy gate? What does it mean in terms of a positive formulation of the law as set forth by Jesus to recognize the stranger in the land is our neighbors, whom we are to love even as we love ourselves and our own kinfolk. To be sure, if we're to think of governmental nurturing today, our thoughts must confront much more complex matters than was typical of those past wrestlings with the proper role of government in ordering civil society. For some of us, though, the nurturing image associated with a lawful ordering of collective life is still a compelling one. And in that regard, the law to which the biblical writers point can still be seen as setting forth the contours of a loving civil order. In a constitutional democracy, we don't need to pin our present day hopes for a healthy leadership in finding nursing fathers to govern us. But that does not mean that we look in vain for a legal system that allows justice to come down like rain upon the newly mown grass and showers that uh, water the earth. So to repeat uh, Rousseau's assessment of Calvin's contribution to the promotion of a sound legal order, as long as the love of the homeland and liberty is not extinguished among us, the memory of that great man will never cease to be blessed. When Rousseau penned that tribute, he was thinking primarily of Calvin's influence in 16th century Geneva. A good case, however, can be made for extending that celebration of the insights of that great man to places that are, for many of us, much closer to home. Thank you. And since I have 10 minutes, uh, we can jump right into questions, yeah, or, or reproof. The phrase has come around recently is the nanny state. Would yeah. you replace it with the nursing state? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I've thought of that. That's fascinating. I mean, I, I think that the uh, Scottish divines who thought they were following Calvin on this, uh, uh, maybe it's a bit of a put-down version of it, but that uh, the nanny state would be something like a nursing, a nursing parental state. Yeah. And it's not, a, it, it's, it's not insignificant that we refer to the fatherland, the motherland. I mean, you know, it, it, it's deeply ingrained in our 
uh, political rhetoric or well, patriotic I think rhetoric. The phrase nanny state is sometimes used as kind of an admonition, you know, oh, yeah. to do this as yeah. opposed to encouraging the flourishing of yeah. Uh, human Yeah, and the difference would be whether we treat everyone as infants uh, and or, or whether there's a kind of adult version of nurturing. Yeah. Up there, please. Okay. Yeah. There seems to be a rewriting of history or a lot of negativity about Calvin these days in different th schools of theology. Could you address where that comes from and how you think that should be counted? Yeah. Well, thank you. Uh, well, the, the, the image, uh, you know, a couple of things. I, I spoke at the Jewish Studies Center at UCLA a while back and uh, uh, my rabbi friend introduced me as a Calvinist. We're talking about the Torah. And he said, he's going to give a Calvinist view. And, and afterward, this uh, middle-aged Jewish couple came up to me and they said, uh, you know, we really enjoyed uh, what you said and appreciate it, uh, but we just had we kind of puzzled about something. Did Rabbi call you a Calvinist? And I said, yeah. And they said, well, that seems so odd. And I said, well, why? And they said, well, you seem like such a nice guy. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I, I said, well, why wouldn't a Calvinist be a nice guy? And I said, well, like, don't you believe that God, like, chooses some and not others? <laughs> and I said, yeah, like, God chooses Israel and not the Philistines and not the Moabites and not the Midianites. And they looked at me kind of strange. They said, well, that, that gives us something to think about. You know? <laughs> uh, uh, I, I do think that sense of an arbitrary God who uh, wants some people in and others just wants them to suffer for all eternity uh, I, I, I don't think you find that in Calvin, uh, that, that, that nasty imagery of that. And then secondly, he did some stupid things. I mean, you know, the reference in the earlier session, I mean, the, the burning of Servetus uh, at the stake. Uh, this, uh, I mean, you, you can excuse him a little bit by saying he wasn't the only, you know, people, I mean, a lot of Catholics and Anglicans and others who burned people at the stake too. But uh, uh, it wasn't very nice. And uh, so I, I think uh, uh, he has, uh, there is a tendency in, a, in an age of theological amnesia uh, to uh, pick up on, on isolated facts and then create uh, caricatures and stereotypes. So some of us are trying to counter that. Yeah. yeah, way up there, way in the back. To go back to the nanny state uh, comment, um, so where, is, where do you discern the line well, again, I'm, I'm not sure. I mean, I, I like the idea of nurture, and that is that a government ought to be concerned about kids and the kind of education they get. And I mean, that's pretty obvious stuff. I think the agape side of it is just going beyond. It, it's 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 a government that actively looks for the cause of the widow, the orphan, the marginalized, the stranger in the land, and uh, isn't just thinking about uh, what we, what, you know, uh, what, what negative duties toward them, but, but saying, uh, you know, the, are, are, there, are there ways in which we ought to promote the cause? Are there ways we ought to build these people up uh, to provide opportunity? <coughs> and, uh, there are lots of ways of spinning that across the political spectrum, but I think it's an active, uh, the, the, the conviction that, that at God's center of vision are people who for us are on our, on our margins, and that to try to see where God's looking, uh, so that you get Daniel saying, uh, hear my word, O king, to a, to a pagan king, or, or Psalm 72, I, I mean, I'm sorry, Jeremiah 29, verse, uh, that early, where the people of uh, Israel and Judah are, are, are carried off into a pagan city. And then Jeremiah comes and says, here's the new deal from God. You don't have a temple here. You don't have godly rulers. You don't have laws that are based on direct revelation. Uh, but uh, build houses and live in them. Uh, plant gardens and eat the produce. Marry off your sons and daughters and multiply in the land. And then this. But seek the, the, the shalom of the city in which I place you in exile. And pray to the Lord on its behalf, for in its shalom you will find your shalom. You know? And for, for people to be guided by that vision of shalom, which is more than just ordering society. It's a just, peaceful, human flourishing kind of uh, ordering of society. And to be guided by that in making laws and uh, formulating policies and adjudicating cases, I think, uh, is, uh, 
It's not, again, I think the nanny state is a kind of, uh, their parents and we're children and they know what's good for us kind of thing. I think that can be dangerous, except in a case of children. Uh, but uh, anyway, that's that's fine. You, you, yeah. There's a part of me that, that thinks that uh, in, in looking at book four of the institutes, um, book four, chapter 20, that, yeah. that, that, that when, when Calvin's talking about uh, the, the magistrate having this responsibility of, of promoting peace and concord and that, and that it's... And manners. It's rather inseparable from his, his, his uh, promoting the idea of governments as promoting the one true faith. True faith. Yeah. Um, at the same time, in book two of the Institutes, Calvin also praises the ancient lawgivers, you know, the, yeah. the pagan Greeks. Seneca, Cicero. Yeah. Their wisdom in, in, yeah. in making laws. And so, you know, I. I have my own way of trying to read those together. I know. But it, it, it's not immediately obvious that the Kelvin who's saying those things in book two is is thinking in exactly the same way as when he's talking in book four about the Christian yeah. magistrate promoting the one true church at the same time as he is promoting power. So I'm just I'm Yeah, that's a good question and it takes a long I, I'm inclined to integrate the two and four on, on that. I mean I, I, I think that the contemporary version of it would be not uh, to uh, a privilege one, one, one church, but I, I think uh, uh, it would be kind of a contemporary application of Calvin to say uh, to governments that want to ban the burqa. <laughs> uh, suppose we ask the question: How can we find ways for Islam to flourish in a pluralistic society, not just to be restricted, but to flourish in a pluralistic society, in the way in which we've allowed Amish to flourish? in our society without telling them what they can wear or what they can't wear, or, or uh, orthodox nuns. <laughs> uh, and uh, and, and to, to, to really be thinking about how diverse communities of faith, or even no faith, can flourish within the bounds of, uh, of rules of justice and tranquility and manners. <laughs> uh, so I, I think there, there are ways to put all of that together, and uh, I think Calvin was drawing on Seneca and Cicero and other Aristotle uh, in some good ways uh, that were compatible with Book Four. Yeah. yeah. I guess in part I'm not. Well, I, I'm I'm not sure, but I might uh, I might be willing to go with a um, supported um, the nursing state of Calvin, Mr. Leader, given given uh, your. <coughs> description of him and maybe even the Scottish leaders, but I'm wondering if the, um, to have a, a nursing state requires a common perception of the good within a society yeah. and whether our society is just so diverse yeah. that we can't have a yeah. common perception of the good and so it's better to, much as I hate it, let everybody do their own thing. Yeah, no, I, I agree. I think that's a big challenge, although I'm, I haven't given up on it. I mean, I, I do think it would be possible to sit down with diverse, and we've had discussions like this with Sikhs and Christians and Jews and Muslims and Buddhists and Hindus and the like, and just say, uh, can we agree that, that uh, uh, we want each other to flourish in ways that are appropriate uh, and that do not violate our own uh, convictions? And can we at least find ways of uh, laying that out uh, I don't think you're ever going to get a, 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 a kind of a meta picture of it all. I think uh, a lot of it is uh, adjustment, but, but the whole history in the United States has been one of adjustments. We start off with a Puritan, they didn't even like the Baptist, you know. After, after a while, you get the Quakers coming along and they didn't like them, and, but, but we made adjustments finally. Then 19th century, you get Jehovah's Witnesses, you get Christian Science, you get Mormons, and it didn't look like they would ever fit in. I mean, what do you do when you've got a religion that won't let, let their dying child have a blood transfusion, you know? But we developed a legal, a, 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 a way of handling that. Get into the 20th century with immigrant groups and especially newer immigrations. Islam presents some, some new challenges in that regard. Uh, but th there has been a history of the past of making those adjustments and finding working solutions 
Uh, the Jehovah's Witnesses don't like it, that, uh, or Christian Science don't like it, when the state temporarily takes over the parental function in order to save the life of a child. Well, but uh, at, at least they don't try to, you know, do a lot more than that to restrict them. And uh, we, we respect the rights of pacifists and, and all the rest. And I, I just think that it's an important ongoing conversation to look for the kind of accommodations and adjustments that will, 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 will work. And we're going through a tremendous one right now in terms of same-sex marriage and, and issues of that sort. Those of us who are pretty conservative on those things, nonetheless, think that there might be a way in which we can sit down with each other and say, what would it take for you, what would it take for us to respect each other's deepest convictions and, and commitments to certain values? Uh, and we find some accommodation on this yeah. in the civil society. Yeah, thank you. I am going to exercise my prerogative to thank, uh, thank Dr. Mao. <laughs> Fuller, Fuller trustee, so he's one of my bosses. Yeah. So. <laughs> and to allow him to catch his plane. So thank you very much again. Yeah, thank you. Well, I'm delighted to uh, introduce Dean Fisher. Dean Robert Fisher is the Dean and Professor of Law at the University of St. Thomas School of Law. His scholarship explores the intersection of law, religion, and public policy with a particular focus on the religious and moral dimensions of professional identity. Two, two recent books that uh, would, should be of no interest to most of us here in the audience, Martin Luther King Jr. and the Morality of Legal Practice, Lessons in Love and Justice, and then an, an, an earlier book, Conscience and the Common Good, Reclaiming the Space Between the Person and the State. Uh, Dean Vischer will be uh, addressing us for, um, on, on the subject is, is agape the last best hope for the legal profession? And once again, we'll have a time for questions and comments at the end. Dean Vischer. Thank you. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity to speak to you. I'll be speaking to you as a lawyer, not as a theologian, but hopefully uh, my words will have some resonance and, and some interest to the non-lawyers in the room uh, as well. Uh, in terms of the relationship between agape and the practice of law, I first got an inkling of this relationship pretty late in my professional formation. I'd already been through law school. I was working at a, at a firm, and it was the first time I'd been given my own case to manage. And I, uh, I, had, I had learned the facts of the case, and it sounded pretty dry to me. It was a, it was a contract dispute between two uh, companies over some allegedly defective uh, packaging material and I'm thinking okay well this is a nice case to cut my teeth on but it's not gonna certainly be anything to write home about and so I went down uh, went down to visit with the client and I had my uh, discovery plan all mapped out and I knew what we needed to talk about to figure out what the each step of the litigation was gonna look like and I was ready to go and I met with the client and it was a it was a <coughs> mid-level manager who was the central person in the case that I was gonna be working with on the case and I met him for the first time, ready to go on the details of the discovery plan, and he was a wreck. He was a wreck, because his actions were at the center of this litigation. And from my perspective, what a boring matter this is, defective packaging. For him, it had turned his life upside down. He felt responsible for uh, liability that could cause uh, the company to go under. He said it was causing problems in his marriage. He couldn't sleep. He couldn't even get in the neighborhood of talking about a discovery plan. He just wanted to be listened to, right? For a while, I thought he just wanted to be held. We didn't go <laughs> that far, but, but I remember this stark realization of, wow, he is looking to me for um, emotional sustenance, encouragement, sort of rallying him. And, uh, and initially I thought, you know, I'm, this is one reason I went to law school and into a corporate litigation, so I didn't really have to <laughs> do this stuff. Um, and the funny thing, and in retrospect, kind of the sad thing is, you know, those first hours of our meeting, uh, I felt as though I was stepping outside the role of the lawyer. That, okay, I'll be the lawyer later. First, I have to be just the human being, right? Meeting 
needs. And it's only later that I would look back and say, no, 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 that was, that was part of the core of what, of what lawyers do. Um, and I wouldn't have named it as agape, but, but there's an element of that there. So let me give you my takeaway point uh, right at the outset. Lawyers who seek to practice agape by acting as moral subjects in their client relationships have never faced a particularly easy road, uh, but I believe the road is getting more difficult by the day in the American legal profession. I believe that this road does not only make um, the practice of agape more difficult, it also makes the continued viability of the legal profession as opposed to a marketplace of legal service providers uh, more tenuous. So I approach agape through the ministry of uh, Dr. King. And uh, in Dr. King's words, agape is the love of God working in the lives of men. And thus when we love on the agape level, we love men not because we like them, not because their attitudes and ways appeal to us, but because God loves them. The key for King was that agape is a disinterested love in the sense that it is a love which the individual seeks not a, in which the individual seeks not his own good but the good of his neighbor and does not discriminate between worthy and unworthy people or based on any qualities people possess. I mean, those words are probably familiar to many of you. Uh, agape, as envisioned and practiced by King, does not passively take the shape of the neighbor's own stated preferences. Stepping into the neighbor's shoes does not mean that we reflexively adopt the neighbor's subjective understanding of his own best interest. Sympathy for the neighbor gives agape its real world traction, but agape's implications cannot be defined solely by the neighbor's lived experience. Agape pushes the lover and the loved to look beyond themselves. So an example from King's own work, I would say, is his, his, when he burst onto, onto the public stage with the Montgomery bus boycott. What folks sometimes overlook is how much suasion he had to show to his own congregants about the value of this boycott. These were you know, elderly women walking miles every day for months and months back and forth to work. And they, you know, many of them thought that was the craziest idea ever. Why in the world would they do this? Why would they persist in it? And so, it, it, to the extent you view roughly them as, as, as a client-like, where he was seeking their best interest, it, King was not the mouthpiece saying, okay, what do you guys want to do now? All right, we're going to take this to the media and persist in the program. He first had to help them see their own long-term best interest. Right? So it started, his practice of agape started by entering into their shoes, understanding their experience, and getting them to see that ultimately it was in their best interest to persist in this boycott. It was not simply a, reflective, a, a reflexive um, accommodation to their own stated best interests. Uh, so in loving his neighbor, friend or foe, black or white, King was a subject, investing himself in the neighbor in order to see the world through the neighbor's eyes, but insisting that the neighbor expand their view to encompass a truer, less isolated vision of their own well-being. So what does this mean for lawyers? Well, there are legitimate concerns, when you talk about a lawyer as a moral subject, legitimate concerns about the lawyer's understanding of the moral good trumping the client's uh, understanding of the moral good. Um, but that does not, in my view, warrant the lawyer abdicating uh, his or her own moral agency. Especially in cases involving large and sophisticated clients, lawyers and clients tend not to engage each other on the moral dimension of the representation. Too often, the lawyer permits the client's moral assertion to hold sway without engaging it. This is a primary dynamic underlying the lawyer as mouthpiece paradigm. The lawyer pursues the client's objectives to the brink of illegality, never bothering to unpack the moral implications of the chosen course or to give the client reason to reflect on those implications. So we could talk for hours about Enron. I'll just say a little bit about Enron. In, in, the, in the case of Enron, Enron's lawyers appear to have offered little resistance or even reflection on the path charted by Enron's managers. Similar stories emerged in the wake of the collapse of Refco and other companies uh, where the lawyers would say we had technical justifications for not disclosing this information and besides that we were acting at the explicit direction of our clients. 
Um, while many critics would accuse the attorneys for Enron or Refco or these other companies of being too loyal to their clients, in reality, they were not loyal enough. Right? They acted as conduits for the client's stated objectives, not as moral subjects calling the clients to reflect critically on the wisdom and implications of these objectives. When lawyers ignore moral intuitions about a client's plan, they may be ignoring potential grounds for liability, or at least grounds for a deeper conversation about the client's long-term interests. Lawyers who fail to heed Agape's admonition to act as subjects will be unable to serve as a needed reality check. In Enron's case in particular, this meant that managers' narrowly defined vision of the corporation's best interests went unchallenged. If we want lawyers to help their clients steer clear of these debacles, as I hope we do, we are looking to lawyers for more than technical expertise. To the extent that these companies' lawyers acted as empty vessels by which their clients could achieve their own perceived interests, the lawyers served neither the client's actual interests nor the interests of the non-shareholder constituents with whom the client's interests are invariably linked. These companies needed a relationship with a moral subject possessing legal expertise, not simply a series of transactions with a technician possessing legal expertise. Now, Agape may seem to be an uneasy fit for the corporate lawyer, for most of the human beings whose interests were marginalized in the episode of Enron and other companies, shareholders, rank and file employees, community members, uh, are not in direct relationship with the lawyer. They are far from action and out of sight. Practicing agape in the context of a face-to-face -face relationship with a real human being is hard enough. Practicing agape in the context of representing a corporate entity made up of far-flung and often anonymous stakeholders seems more difficult by an order of magnitude. So how does agape apply to distant and impersonal relationships? This is not a question that was foreign to Dr. King. From the outset of his ministry, he preached agape to congregants whose oppressors included distant legislatures, le legislators and judges. In such context, Agape aims at less at the particular needs of the distant individual and more at what we cannot help but know about human well-being. Indeed, the conditions necessary for the flourishing of distant individuals will often be the same conditions necessary for the flourishing of those who stand before us. Right, so the racist views harm the well-being of both the whites who jeered participants in the Montgomery bus boycotts and the government officials who erected the legal framework that made the boycott necessary. The nonviolence that marked the behavior of King's congregants toward the jeerers in their immediate path had positive effects that spilled over into city councils and state legislatures across the region. Conversely, by elevating the short-term interests of the company's executives over the long-term interests of the company's shareholders and other stakeholders, Enron's lawyers did neither group any favors witness the fates of Ken Lay and Jeffrey Skilling. One clue about what it means to practice agape in a distant and impersonal relationship may be to remember what it means to practice agape in the relationship that lies before us. Now, as I mentioned at the outset, the road to practicing agape may be getting more difficult. Competitive pressures are pushing law firms uh, and, and uh, legal consumers in general to greater efficiencies and those efficiencies may make the attorney-client client relationship more difficult to distinguish from other provider-consumer relationships. Clients understandably have become more aggressive about costs and we have more avenues by which to become aggressive about costs than we ever have before. There is reason to believe that the attorney's role as trusted personal advisor will recede from view and be replaced with a conception of the lawyer as technician. Uh, as the relationship becomes more distant, more fungible, and less personal, the relationship may lack the resources to support any function beyond the strictly technical, and the lawyer may act, uh, the lawyer may not have the needed knowledge to uh, act as anything more than a mouthpiece. The lawyer is subject uh, may become even more marginal to the role of the lawyer. Right. So let me talk a little bit about trust because I think a lot of this uh, hinges on trust. Trust is a willingness to make oneself vulnerable to another. It is relational. 
An arm's length transaction between two interest maximizing individuals may often require a certain degree of trust, but that's not the quality of trust that has made possible the attorney's roles as counselor, advocate, and public citizen. Trust as a rational calculation may work fine in my relationship with a car dealer, but how will it work in my relationship with my attorney? It's this sort of relational trust, by which I mean a client's trust in the relationship itself as opposed to the client's trust in the market or regulatory safeguards in which the relationship is embedded that is essential to the lawyer's practice of agape, but that's under increasing pressure today. The boundaries between the provision of legal services and the provision of other business-related services are quickly blurring. And lawyers need to come to grips with the fact that one's status as a professional is of decreasing relevance to one's success meeting the demands of customers. The blurring of these boundaries is best captured by several overlapping trends, uh, all of which shape the long-term viability of relational trust, and with it, I would submit the capacity to practice agape. So one obvious one is globalization. The global provision of legal services involves less personal connections between provider and client. The lack of face-to-face -face interaction is not conducive to trust. Researchers have found repeatedly that visual contact significantly increases cooperation rates and social dilemmas, even though the ability to see the other participants does not change the potential payoffs. Right? I'm not sure if Skype can fill the void. We'll find out. Beyond the importance of visual contact, the global provision of legal services often occurs without the shared background of cultural norms and values in which trust is rooted. Trust relationships develop from a sense that we are responsible for each other. By outpacing personal familiarity and the reach of law, the global economy tests the boundaries of trust. A lack of trust may contribute to the tendency to use lawyers for their technical competence on discrete tasks rather than relying on them for a wider ranging advisory role. Now, much of the focus on the outsourcing that's occurring in the legal services market focuses on the fact that an overseas third party has been brought into the attorney-client relationship. But there's another element that is just as important, if not more important. Outsourcing is based on the disaggregation of legal services. If legal services like manufacturing can be stripped down to their component parts and tasked to the lowest cost provider, is relational trust still part of the equation? Put simply, can relationships be disaggregated? Other contributing factors uh, to the, the pressure on trust, and with it I would say the capacity to practice agape, include the rise of in-house counsel, the decline of self-regulation, the potential rise of multidisciplinary practice, and the continued deterior deterioration of trust-enhancing culture within law firms. On this last factor, studies show that the best way to, term, to determine whether or not a person is trustworthy is to ask him whether or not he trusts others. A lawyer whose workplace is devoid of relational trust will not be well equipped or inclined to contribute to relational trusts flourishing with clients. Given these trends, I believe it's accurate to say that the attorney-client relationship is moving from being more of a trusting in type of relationship to a trusting that, by which I mean clients may not feel confident that they trust in their lawyer as their lawyer, and more trusting that the lawyer will not do X, Y, or Z because there's this sanction available or this <coughs> sanction available. If that's the case, what have we lost? Uh, if l I would put it this way, if lawyers are more than technicians, then clients are losing something when the thinning of trust contributes to the thinning of the attorney-client relationship. Attorneys are losing something too. That's a whole different conversation that we can uh, get into in questions if you'd like. But I think there also may be regulatory fallout. This could become a self-fulfilling prophecy that then becomes a spiral, right? Uh, it's not clear why the public should value and support a whole web of privileges and powers for attorneys if attorneys are engaged simply in a series of self-interest maximizing market transactions removed from the relationships of trust in which a more fulsome understanding of the client's well-being and the uh, public interest can be productively explored. 
At the same time, the changes to the profession that we're currently undergoing make trust even more vital. And there's a huge opportunity for attorneys to fill the void as the lack of system trust, as, as the stretching of business relationships really puts a premium on folks who can be uh, at the nexus of these, uh, of these issues. Trust is needed as role negotiability increases. And let me just say for a couple minutes, a, a little a word about legal education, because I think legal education has a role to play in promoting the importance of trust. Corporate clients' definition of attorney effectiveness moves beyond excellent technical competence toward excellent relationship skills. In law school, there's not much time that's spent on client counseling exercises, although I hope that's changing, um, or the importance of empathy, perceptual clarity, uh, listening skills, reflective moral judgment, these are things just as, just as important as critical thinking ability. If lawyers only bring technical competence to the table, much of what lawyers do can be stripped down to separate tasks and distributed to other providers. But what if the bundle of tasks is more than the sum of its parts? Agape reminds us that seeking the good of the client requires the lawyer to act as a moral subject, not as a mouthpiece. The attorney's provision of legal services occurs in the context of a real human relationship with her client. Whether the client is an actual person or an organization that is managed by and created to serve the interests of actual persons. The richness of the relationship will be a function in part of the tasks for which the attorney has been retained. The, oppor uh, the opportunities for and appropriateness of moral engagement will vary from a one-time routine closing on a home sale to document intensive discovery work to an ongoing counseling role in a business to, con to a contentious child custody case, et cetera. Whether or not the practice of agape manifests itself in every case, agape can shape the lawyer's self-conception and deepen her commitment to active participation in facilitating the client's well-being in a way that cannot easily be limited to certain categories of legal practice. Over the coming years, we're going to see a lot of changes in the provision of legal services. I think one key indicator of the health of the legal profession as a profession will be the viability of agape as a hallmark of the lawyer's calling. Thanks very much. We have any uh, questions or comments? For Dean Vichy. Sorry, but uh, can you draw an analogy to the medical uh, side of things? For example, we don't talk often about the delivery of medical services. We talk about delivery of medical care. And I wonder whether uh, lawyers miss about here when they talk about I'm in the legal service business as opposed to the legal care business. And I wonder if you can comment. Yeah, and I'm, I'm certainly not an expert on the, on the system of delivering medical care. I think you see some of the pressures there, but usually it will at least at some point culminate in, at this point, a human interaction with the care provider. That might change, and you're seeing some of those changes already, but it becomes harder to talk about legal care if all you are is one of a team of 50 contract attorneys brought to sit at long tables and go through boxes of documents as one small part of a very big case, right? Or, and you can go through lots and lots of examples. So I think there's some of the same tensions, but I think the provision of legal services is, is much farther down that path uh, than healthcare is. Um, yeah, I think to follow up, I mean, the CVS dump cigarettes thing, like, provides a medical service and There are times when I get my flu shot at the grocery store because I don't want the doctor to tell me I should have exercised. Right? <laughs> you know? um, I yeah. avoid that. I don't want to hear that I should stop smoking, right, or whatever it is. So, so how much do you think is consumer driven? We just want the services that we want, and we don't want to have the. Well, so it's consumer driven at the high end of the market because it's the corporate clients who have discovered, hey, there are ways we can drive down our legal costs just as we've been driving costs down on all the other units of our business and now legal is not exempt. I think one of the problems is the vast majority of the legal services provider market has, has uh, 
built itself toward the service at that high end. And so as that changes, the whole market changes. Um, so I have some doubts whether ultimately it's, it's totally a good thing at the high end, although most of them are f sophisticated enough that they can at least pick up the pieces when things go badly. But it changes the whole market and then you have so many of the consumers of legal services who are also affected by it. I mean, this gets into bigger issues because we, we have already priced out the vast majority of folks with legal needs in the country and getting toward a more commoditized system might be better than nothing for many of those people, but would the better situation have been where we hadn't priced them out in the first place and they could still have personal attention and care, if that makes sense. Yeah. Uh, a quick follow-up. How do you think this affects students going to go to law school? Because we all know that there's so many fewer people going to go to law school. Do you, part of that is the sense that it's just not as rewarding as it was? Uh, <coughs> or is it yeah, are, are law school applications down? <laughs> yeah, I didn't. Oh, maybe, maybe out here in California, I didn't. Uh, the, uh, yeah, th that is part of it. I mean, you know, when you talk to students, I think, and this is not just law students, but I think law students in particular, they want to be invested in something that's bigger than themselves. They want it to matter. They want to have an impact. And you still can. There's, there's still avenues where that happens. But w at, the, at the premium jobs that folks have been fighting over for many years in law school, because that's the sign that, hey, you've made it, there it's moving more toward a commoditized approach to law. And there you say, wow, really? That's, that's what I did all this for? Um, and not always. I mean, there's some great jobs at big firms where you can get, avoid that. But it's moving much more in that direction. Uh, way back, Matt. So in the, just to recap what you're saying, so in this conception that a lot of lawyers now are legal technicians, and I think that they're, you know, that's not true for all areas of practice. Right, so right, right, right. We hear that a lot. Yep. Are the opportunities for agape moral engagement with the client, which I think is what you're getting at the end, are they still there but maybe more attenuated? And I don't know if that's accurate from what you're saying. And then also, how does this affect Hmm. That's good. Okay, so the first part, well, I, I would say this. W I think we all have the opportunity to practice agape no matter what we're doing. And so if I'm, if I'm sitting at a long table going through boxes of documents, I can still practice agape with the person who's next to me going through another box of documents. So that doesn't change. I think what's, in, what's threatened is the opportunity to practice agape on professional avenues of impact with my client. That might be changing. That's still there in, in some fields more than others, family law, criminal, defense work, et cetera. I focus more on the on business law, the, the side of it, where that's changing. Um, and then and the second question about is, is whether professional development needs to be focused more on the development of our... Yeah, if, if those opportunities are more attenuated, at least in certain areas, yeah. then is this emphasis now on legal education, on professional identity, is it really more than about the internal development of the law students? That's a great question. It's a great question. And I think that we haven't quite got our hands around what it looks like. So, you know, there's all this you know, talk about e-discovery and preparing our students for e-discovery and things. And, and I think that's important and that's good. A lot of the straight e-discovery jobs look pretty, you know, not real attractive <laughs> to me if you're, if you're interested in, in having these client relationships. And so that's a that's a struggle. I think law school will have to figure out what they're doing. I mean, I have some hesitation about going pell-mell down the path of training everybody for e-discovery and for these law technology jobs, just because of who law school has traditionally attracted. So I still think there is potential to prepare our students distinctively in professional development that is aimed toward service to others. So it's not just about them inside, it's a moral development where they become less self-centered in their moral decision-making, more other-centered in their moral decision-making. That's at the core of it. 
how that's going to play out for them in the workplace, we don't know what that's going to look like five years from now, ten years from now. But we can still be focused on giving those core things and say it's always a good thing to have experienced moral growth, regardless of, of what you're doing. One last thing. Um, by doing that, I would hope that our graduates are more competitively positioned for those jobs that are there that will be service oriented. I mean, that's, that's part of it. So part of it's in the institutional self-interest to be getting out in front of We them. have time for two short questions. <laughs> uh, David. Okay. Um, I don't know if this is true, but I mean, it would seem to me that you know, it's, it's, it's a lot easier to, to see the, the lawyer as a technician uh, if you take a more positivistic view of the law. The law is yeah. just what the governing authorities say uh, it is. Whereas the idea of the lawyer as a professional in the older sense makes a lot more sense um, if, you, if you have a more naturalistic view of law or even the old common law where, where the law is, is part of this broader moral order. Um, and do you think that's true? And if so, how does that affect the way you think about um, the way you have to practice? I, I don't necessarily think that's true in part because if, if it's just if law is just positivistic then isn't there even more importance placed on having someone in a role to say hey but think about this right if the law does not reflect a moral order we want someone to be raising the moral order don't we so I think either way the moral and yeah yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you, yeah, yeah. The difficulty is: Does it seem like you're stepping further outside the bounds of what the natural attorney-client relationship would be? I think moral engagement is important, regardless of your conception of law. One last question. So you're kind of keeping this, I think, a little um, small, and I want to ask you how much bigger you'd be willing to take it because I sort of hear a kind of a, uh, a little bit nostalgia for the United States still have agave trust the way we yeah. use the professional. And I wonder when you said. You know, the whole is more than the sum of the parts. I was wondering what what profession or calling is there for which that's not true and being this natural because of this disaggregation of labor in this particular part. Or was this happening to teachers? Is this happening to minors? Is this happening to manufacturing? Or is it just one instance of the water? Well, now I'm really depressed. <laughs> <laughs> I guess I'll sit down now. Um, Yes, and, and it's, it's a concern, and that's why I don't, I don't want my paper to sound like, here's what's the problem, here's the solution, we'll just talk about this stuff in law school, and it'll be fine. No, we still have to deal with the market reality. Uh, I guess I would put it differently. We're in a period of transition from the disaggregation that's, that's going on. Uh, the fact that there is disaggregation does not mean that there won't subsequently be some aggregation of tasks as found useful in the market and that there can be uh, the need for the kind of agape-centered service and relationships <coughs> arising in the future. I don't know what that is, but I don't think that these trends are only one direction for now into eternity. That's what I would say. But right now we just can't see it. So thank uh, you let's very express much. our thanks to Dean Vischer. <laughs>